Hey, what's up? Dave with Brazos Valley Strength. Today I'm here with the long awaited how to sumo deadlift complete guide. We'll call it the complete guide, but I think probably encyclopedia is gonna be a better word for this. My goal today is to come up with a good reference point for everybody to come back to this video and at least lead them to other videos if we can't identify the weakness and fix that weakness right here. So for the context of this video, I'm just not going to be able to dive into every single detail and fix all those weaknesses. But I think we'll be able to at least talk about them and identify them. So I have plenty of other videos on sumo deadlifting. I'm going to reference many of them. So if I do that, if I reference a previous video to where I've already elaborated on these things in depth, I'll put it in the little title card up here in the corner. If I haven't made the video, I certainly already do have a plan on very many videos that I'll be making in the future. So I'll reference those if I haven't uh, made the video yet and let you know that it's at least coming. If I don't have a video on it and I don't reference anything, please let me know in the comments that you'd like me to elaborate. I can certainly do that. So this, is, this should be a starting point for everybody to help identify weaknesses, hopefully solve very many of those. What we're going to do today is break down the deadlift completely. Each one of these steps in order should build on the last one. If you're new here, please watch the entire video. Every one of the steps won't really be able to explain everything independently. It will build on previous steps. So without that context, I think some of the things that I say may end up being misinterpreted. So I do think it's important that the order that I explain these things in does stay intact. So we're gonna move through that process, hopefully pretty smoothly. After that, you can come back and identify the weaknesses and build from there. The starting point for good deadlifts has to be a good brace. I already covered this topic extensively in my how to low bar squat video, so I'm not going to dive into it more here, but there are some specific differences. So if you don't have a really thorough, good understanding of how to brace in general, and what I mean there is really the difference between just expanding your air into the belt and being able to create tension with your muscles, it's just not going to work. So I think that that video that I did is pretty good, but still even many people who have watched that video, clients that I work with regularly, still don't really get it fully. And I, I think that you have to put in a lot of time to be able to understand these things, especially when we're talking about being able to create tension in the abdominal wall. So many of those videos that I use in that, the drills that I use, talking about manipulating the pelvic position, expanding with your muscles into the, I think I use a, a plate in that video, but expanding the muscles while still being able to breathe, I'm doing it right now and still talking. That's where a lot of people really struggle. For the deadlifts, it's going to be critical that we're able to differentiate those two. So we're not just cranking down our belt tighter, that we're not just purely holding our breath really tight. We have to do a good job of being able to use the abdominal muscles to, to create tension and stability through our trunk. The reason being is that for the most part with the deadlifts, I don't think that we should be using quite as much air, quite as much expansion into the belt. So in my how to low bar video, I took so much of what I talked about was trunk stability, that we're doing everything we possibly can to be able to create rigidity and maintain that and not have any movement at all in the trunk. That's not going to be the case here. So this section is really just going to get us an intro point into all of the other sections behind it, talking about potentially, di potentially different slack pulls, potentially different positions with our upper back. There's a lot of different things that can interact together. But without good understanding of the brace and how to create pressure in my abdomen, we're just not going to be able to create any sort of good system. So no matter what, you have to be able to create that contraction with your abdominal muscles and understand how the position of your pelvis and your rib cage, how those interact together and how we're trying to create neutrality. Because those concepts, despite any differences in air, any differences potentially with back rounding or back extension, the middle section of your body is going to need to stay the same. So that part is absolutely true. All of the things I talk about in the bracing video for the low bar squats, that is still going to be the exact same thing here. 
I'm going to elaborate more on how much pressure that we should create, especially in the slack pulling area. There's gonna be some differences potentially in that. So that's where you're gonna get most of the information, but I wanted to take the time to make sure that before you go anywhere else, the bracing stuff, you've at least familiarized yourself with the concept and then maybe go back and recreate those drills. But if you don't do that, you're really not gonna be able to, to understand really the rest of these topics. For most people, one of the biggest barriers to deadlifts in general, but specifically sumo deadlifts, is they don't have a great understanding of where their balance needs to be. So I already have a pretty thorough video that I think was done pretty well on how to understand this concept, how to hinge for sumo deadlifts. I'll put that video right there. But I want to expand on that topic a little bit right here and hopefully summarize my thoughts in a way that will flow with the rest of the video. So this section won't have too many specifics on how to fix these things, but the concept absolutely needs to be understood. So the big idea, the big concept that we need to understand here is that my balance needs to be on top of the bar midfoot. Now, I think a lot of times the, the midfoot idea is accurate, but I don't know that it always works for everyone right away, at least uh, like, you know, logically in application when they're trying to feel it. But I think visually what we can really assess, especially when we're filming ourselves and we're looking, taking side videos of the deadlift when we're trying to understand these things is that my shoulder blade or armpit, either way probably works here, needs to be on top of the barbell. So that also should be on top of midfoot or so, but we need to have that stacked. If we don't have that, so many other issues are going to cascade from there. Clearly being in front of the bar is an issue. I don't think that that's the main problem that most people have. I think it's rare that somebody is just starting way out in front of the bar. It, it, I don't see that one very often. But for sumo deadlifts in particular, the main thing that I see people doing way too often is trying to get their balance way behind the bar. There's a few reasons that I think this comes. I think that one of the biggest ones is that people have an assumption that trying to be as upright as they possibly can is always going to be better, but not really having a good understanding of the trade-offs there. So if getting more upright, and maybe we'll just say showing your chest, because I think that's probably the area uh, or the error that people make. If, if trying to show your chest in an effort to at least feel more upright ends up making you too squatty, sitting down too far, making your knee angle get too sharp, your shoulders are going to end up behind the bar. Just like in my how to low bar squat video, so much of what I was talking about was just about creating balance, was just about creating processes in order to keep that bar over your midfoot to actually be able to apply force into the bar. That's gonna be the exact same thing here. Now, the bar, when I'm doing low bar, obviously is resting on my back. That's where my center of mass is. Here, the bar is being held in my hands, but it connects to my shoulders. And specifically, when I do have some sort of angle in my back, we can't think of it as my shoulders being near the front of my body. It's my shoulders with a slight angle on the backside of my body. So armpits, scapula, that's probably a good starting point. So the more upright that you can get, that, that armpit ends up becoming much more accurate as that does end up being stacked on top of the bar. But if when you pull, you get pulled forward dramatically in front of it and you're seeing that position change a whole lot, you're probably setting yourself up in a bad position. So we're going to elaborate in later uh, areas of this video with the top down setup and what I'll call the tipping point in ways that we can really come up with a solution that's gonna be best for you to get there. But first and foremost, for everyone, if you just understand that when you're pulling, you have to have your armpits on top of the bar so that we can have our center of mass in a way that we can press directly down to the floor and pull directly vertically, that will be a big help. So one of the videos that I do have planned here is why I think any sort of exercise that encourages you to lean back and fight against the weight pulling you forward, specifically forward banded deadlifts, I think is absolutely a horrible <laughs> choice. It's just, I, I don't know, the worst thing ever. So I'm gonna have a video that's going to be elaborating on that because I think that that um, concept 
has become a lot more popular recently, uh, and I have some strong feelings there, but we'll elaborate more on that after this video once we have a good understanding of why I think that's so horrible. Unlike my how to low bar video, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time talking about stance for sumo deadlift. We have a lot of options. And unlike with the low bar squat, because with low bar squat, the fact that we actually have to hit depth kind of limits options. People's anatomies just don't always fit for more options. With sumo deadlift, we probably do. We generally have a lot of options that feel pretty comfortable and pretty repeatable for most people. But I wanna start there. What I wanna say as a starting point with finding your stance with a sumo deadlift is it should be comfortable and it should be repeatable. If you can't accomplish those two things and it's really beating you up and you're having problems actually training the deadlift, you might wanna look at other options that could potentially be a little bit more pain-free, comfortable for your body that you can actually train it. So what we wanna do here is come up with some criteria as far as what we want to accomplish with efficiency, with the concept in general. But I think we can look at a few other successful deadlifters and show some ways that people have a wide variety of styles, stance with toe angles, and are still successful. So we'll bring those guys in in a second and look at their videos. But what I wanna say first of all, is that our primary objective, stance with anything, is we are trying to create as efficient as a movement as we can. I think a lot of times people, when they think about efficiency, immediately just think about how upright they are. That to them seems like the most efficient way to move. And to some degree, I talked about this in my how to low bar squat video, was that if we try to get more upright with any movement, there's going to be a trade-off there. My knees have to move more forward. I may create inefficiencies somewhere else. That absolutely applies to the sumo deadlift. So the more upright I am, generally speaking, the sharper of a knee angle that I'm gonna get. I'm gonna be putting more emphasis on my quads being able to actually drive the weight off the floor. Now, that potentially sounds like a good thing, but if I make it to where it's just so much more work in that position, and especially going back to the balance thing, if I create a position to where I'm so upright that my body mass, my center of mass has moved behind the barbell, then I'm just not going to be able to create force from that position anyway. So as a general rule, the two things that we wanna to try to create is a combination of being as upright as you can and your hips being as high as you can. Those things have to coexist. If they're, if they're not coexisting, we're going to run into a lot of these issues with balance where you're ending up too far behind the bar, you're making it extremely difficult off the floor, and other things have to break. Your back has to round, you have to just shift forward in general. So if those two things coexist, we'll be able to create a good position. Now, we're going to be diving into that a little bit more when I'm talking about tipping point and top-down setup stuff. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about knee angle at the moment, but I just want to look at the options that people have as far as their stance width, toe angle, and just how they affect the overall process. As a recommendation for most lifters, if you're just getting started with the sumo deadlift, I would recommend starting a little bit closer than you think. So we can start closer and even on your very first session. I don't think that you have to, to take a very, very close stance with your feet just outside your hands and train that for a long time and see if it works. We wanna find somewhere that feels pretty natural. But I think starting with a relatively close stance, maybe your feet around the power rings on the bar, maybe a little closer, maybe a little wider, is probably a pretty good starting point for most people. Now, what we'll do in this section here is talk about how stance width and toe angle really relate to each other and how they can affect where your hips go, how much balance you have, how much knee travel, how much angle forward you can really have with the deadlift. So we're gonna start our way in and work out. So one really good example of somebody who deadlifts with a pretty close stance and their toes pretty forward is Angelo Fortino. So he's a 83 kilo lifter, and I, I don't know at the moment what his best deadlift is, um, but somewhere in the high 700s. And he deadlifts very close with his feet pretty straightforward. So there's a lot of good things that come from this. It's still a sumo deadlift, right? 
all we need for it to be a sumo deadlift is your hands are inside your legs. That's it. So from there, it's just going to be what ends up feeling the best and what actually allows you to be as strong. If we look at Angelo, his hips are high, his trunk angle is relatively upright, and he accomplishes these things because he allows certain things to happen in a way that fits his anatomy. One of the probably unique things about Angelo is that he allows his knees to travel more forward than what another deadlifter with a pretty close stance, Jamal Browner does. If we look at their toe angle, that's where the main difference comes in. So the more straightforward that your toes are, the more that we are going to have to make adjustments with our knees and our hips. So generally speaking, the more straightforward our toes are, the more of that horizontal movement, if we're looking at it from a, a side profile, that kind of front back movement that we'll see. So the knees potentially do have to move forward in order to create space and to limit how much backwards, how much, how much uh, space we have to create by having our hips move backwards. Because remember, we are trying to create an efficient system to where we have both our trunk angle as upright as possible and our hips being as close to the bar. So Angelo does a great job of creating an efficient system by allowing his knees to travel forward just a little bit. But the big thing here is that he does not displace the bar in front of his midfoot area. So we're still going back to those main rules as far as our balance and being stacked on top of our feet and the bar being directly underneath our armpits. That's where Angelo does a great job. As he pulls, his shins clear back out of the way and there's no issues with the bar being kicked forward. But because he has straighter feet, he's probably anyway going to be able to overcome any issues in balance in the first place. So that's an important concept, is that generally speaking, toes being more forward has some drawbacks. It has some drawbacks because we have to have more of that movement, either knees moving more forward or potentially hips moving more back but a lot of times we're able to overcome some of those things because of the increase in stability in those directions as well. Our feet have that, that ability to actually fight against the changes and balance. Now, Angelo doesn't seem to need it. He tends to do a very, very good job of staying midfoot the whole time, but this is something that I think many people could utilize, is if they do feel like they're always getting pulled forward or if they're having issues with their balance, try a slightly closer stance. We just have to understand that there are going to be some things that have to change to make room for that. And if you feel like your hips have gotten kicked too far back, you may try a slight forward angle with your shins so far that it doesn't actually affect your balance more forward. But we can compare him to Jamal. Jamal does have a pretty close stance, but his toes are angled out a lot more. So he's able to open up his hips significantly more, keep his hips close, but as we can see from his videos, he's very upright and his hips are very close as well. So those two things have created an efficient system for Jamal. Angelo's body apparently doesn't work for that. I have no idea if he's tried or not, but he's very successful and has no reason to change. So as we start closer with the deadlift, we're gonna see that we have many, many more options with our positions, with our, our toe angle. We can do a good job of having our toes forward. And I think for many people, a deadlift closer to Angelo's style is probably something that would work very well. It doesn't have a lot of requirements from external rotation with the hips, from trying to maintain that position off the floor. That is probably a great starting point for a lot of people. When I started deadlifting, however many years ago, my deadlift position was significantly closer than it was right now. Not on purpose, that's just where I felt the best. Over time, it's gotten a little bit wider, but that's just happened through repetitions and through practice and you know, kind of my technique just developing. But I started closer as well. And I think most people in their intro to sumo deadlifts should probably look at that as a good starting point and let the feet drift out as things develop there. On the other side of the spectrum, we can look at people who deadlift with a very, very wide stance. We'll look at three different deadlifters and I think they all pull pretty similarly. So we can look at Blake LeHue, Dan Griggs, and Yuri Belkin. All of these guys deadlift with a very, very wide stance, toes angled pretty far out, and they create arguably one of the most, I guess, iconic looking sumo deadlifts there is. Stance very wide, hips very close, trunk very, very upright. Now, 
all three of these guys have noticeable issues at lockout at times. Not only do they struggle with balance, but sometimes they struggle just to lock the bar out from the, the position that they're in. They just don't have that profile with the balance of their feet to be able to overcome any sort of balance issues at the top and then may even have trouble leaning back. It's an incredibly efficient position, but definitely comes with some drawbacks. One thing that's certainly of note with this, all of these guys deadlift with a deadlift bar. That bar flexing significantly is going to make a very big difference with what their hips, with their position that they can actually get into. I would be curious if they would be able to get in that same position with a power bar, especially as their feet get closer to the plates, they'd have to bring it in anyway. And so what I wanted to say here is that yes, there are positions at the far end of that spectrum that can be very, very successful. But I think people look at the three of these guys and start assuming that that is their ultimate objective, that their goal should not be to start where Angelo is. Their goal should be, I'm a sumo deadlifter now, let me try to start at the extreme. But even those guys have a lot of issues with it. It can be a really, really good tool, but there's some drawbacks. So I think if we look at somebody like myself who deadlifts with what is apparently a very wide stance, I don't really think it is. Uh, it fits my frame significantly better. I'm five foot 11, I have extremely long legs. My feet are basically at the plates. But if we compare what my deadlift looks like on a power bar to what my deadlift looks like on a deadlift bar, I'm using the exact same stance and visually it looks a lot closer. Just from a little bit of trial and error, I've actually found that I feel a little bit more comfortable on a deadlift bar with my stance slightly in from where I would anyway. And I think a lot of this just comes down to the fact that I can get a little bit more power. I can be a little bit more aggressive off the floor and I don't have to limit the range of motion quite as much because the bar is doing that for me. So I think when we're looking at this spectrum right here, we have to be able to have a good starting point and analyze the risk reward. On top of that, if we're trying to create better balance in those positions by moving my feet more forward, that's where I think things are going to get probably very negative for almost everyone. As stances go out, almost always the toe angle needs to change with them. I can't think off the top of my head of anybody who deadlifts with a wide stance and the toes angled forward because the big issue there is that as I reach that widest position, I'm not going to be able to clear with my knees in a way that when I rotate in, I'm going to be able to create an efficient position that my hips don't now become a problem. I can't rotate my knees in when I rotate. So because my stance is now so wide, I'm limiting my options to only having that wide angle position and potentially the drawbacks that come along with it. So for most people, just having this understanding of the spectrum of the options here is probably going to help you find something that fits you. So as the general rule here, if you're just getting going, start a little bit closer. Start with something that feels more comfortable. Don't try to get as upright as you can. Find a position that simultaneously allows you to get as upright as you can and keep your hips as close as you can. We're gonna come up with a lot more details as far as what that hip height means in future sections, but kind of understanding the different concepts of foot angle, toe position, all of those things will definitely add in with the rest of this process. So obviously to create the best deadlift we can, we have to talk about grip to some degree. I'm gonna start by throwing out my bias a little bit here. I am only going to be talking about mixed grip. I don't know how to hook grip. Uh, I've tried to hook grip historically. I have athletes that I coach that do hook grip. I am not an expert. If you're interested in that, I know there's other videos, there's plenty of other videos online that may be able to help you there. But from my experience, I have had way more people switch from a hook grip to a mixed grip than the other way. I, I think that people who have found success doing hook grip, sure, keep it. But many, many people try to solve many of their issues that we talk about in other places in this video by just thinking that their grip or doing a double overhand grip is going to solve all those problems. I don't think that if you're doing mixed grip well and doing all the other steps that mostly will follow this section of the video, I don't think that mixed grip contributes dramatically to people kicking the ball out in front of them or the helicoptering or things like that. 
somewhat, but I think that those things are probably more of a, an error that people are making with how they're setting their back, how they're pulling slack, and the mixed grip at that point can contribute because things are too different. But as we'll talk about later, if you're hanging your arms loosely and engaging and setting things, pulling slack appropriately, I don't think that mixed grip is going to contribute much there. I do think that mixed grip has all of the benefits of still being very much strong enough to be successful with deadlifting without some of the major difficulties that hook grip has with the discomfort and potentially being able to repeat the mixed grip more often. So I do have a video also talking about how to train with straps. I think that that is gonna be useful information. We'll put it right there. Um, because I do, even with mixed grip, keeping my hands healthy is absolutely going to be something that matters here. So we're gonna talk about grip strength a little bit, but mostly we're gonna talk about how to set your grip and all about mixed grip. So I do what I guess some people would call a fingertip grip. Now, I think fingertip grip is sort of the same thing as low bar squat, right? Like there's not a certain point that it becomes a fingertip grip, same as the low bar squat, moving the bar down your back. I guess it's all low bar. But the main point here is that I'm trying to hold the bar as low in my hand as I can and still maintain control over the bar. So this is going to be a very important thing in decreasing your range of motion. Obviously, it can be kind of dramatic, right? It can, it can make a major difference. That little bit of extra space there can allow a lot more rotation. That's gonna be the first thing. The second thing is that people who over grip the bar a lot of times have more issues because that's just not where their grip is the strongest. So this section, just like every other section that we're going to talk about too, is going to talk about us wanting to stabilize the bar in the position that it actually is going to end up in. So the lowest position that we can hold the bar in our hands effectively is where we want to stabilize it. So I think a lot of people go after a fuller grip, gripping their whole hand around the bar because they have grip strength issues and they're, they're afraid that having it hang lower is going to create issues. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. The bar is potentially going to slip lower. And I think a lot of this happens because we don't really understand where that bar is actually going to settle. What I try to show people is that when your wrist and hand are in line. The lowest point in your hand is not going to be when your hand is totally straight. It's actually going to be when it's sitting at an angle a little bit. So if you do farmer's carries or any sort of like grip strength challenge when it's just in a single hand, what you'll find is that the, the grip slips lower and lower, eventually only being held by the first two fingers is really where most people are losing the bar. Now, for some reason, people say you should grip hard with your pinkies or things like that. And I guess maybe the intention with that is just to squeeze hard and have effort overall, but I absolutely disagree with that. As we'll talk about in later sections, we don't wanna to create too much tension in our arms overall, but we do want to create something that has a really strong grip. And to me, the main way that we accomplish that, similarly to hook grips, is by using the index finger, the first two fingers, and the thumb. The other fingers are involved, but if you look at a lot of my deadlift videos, you'll see that my pinky fingers, my little fingers, are pretty much on the un underside of the bar. When I'm gripping the bar, I'm setting my grip as low as I can get it and still having control over it. My pinky is totally underneath it. I'm, I'm not really trying hard to grip it. Now, I'm also not deliberately only having it in my fingers. So this is where I know that I differentiate a little bit, I kind of, um, I, I have a different style than what I know some other people do. Some people fully have the bar in their fingers, past the actual palm of their hand. For me, I have never been able to be successful with this. And one of the reasons is I think that we don't really get any ability to use our thumbs there. I think that the thumb can help a lot with gripping the bar and helping with maintaining the tension on the fingers. And if it goes too low, maybe it's just me, but I am only now holding it with my finger strength at that point. And for me, it's not nearly enough. Now, if you can hold it, and if you can hold max effort loads at that weight, great. 
but I've had many people who have tried to switch to a, a grip that, have, that has been just below the palm of their hand to where it's actually in only their fingers, and it feels fantastic with lighter loads. But as they get heavier, it becomes a major issue. So if it's something that you can actually hit the heavy weight with, <laughs> great for you. I'm jealous because it does reduce the range of motion, I, I think enough to matter. But if not, what I'll say is that the fingertip grip doesn't need to be as low as possible. It's just as low as possible that you can still maintain your grip on the bar. So for me, we're really thinking about the first two fingers and we're actually going to have it sit a little bit above the, the, where, you know, the, the crease in my hand. So it is gonna be in the palm a little bit. So when I grip the bar, I'm trying to set it as low as I can. You can, hopefully you can see in the video, I don't actually roll my hands around, right? This is gonna be a mistake for you to roll your hands around because we want it in line. Again, we're trying to eliminate any sort of change, any sort of um, displacement from our original position. So I'm not actually gripping it and kind of rotating like that, but I'll use it for this purpose. So when I grip the bar, I'm trying to set that grip in the same way that I pull slack later on. As I pull slack, I'm trying to pull the slack out of my grip and pull it into the lowest position that I can maintain that strength. So me personally, I'm gripping fairly hard with my first two fingers, but it's essentially me just holding on to the lowest point that I can get. So as I'm creating that space, I'm not trying to hold the bar close in any way. I'm not trying to hold it in my hand. I'm trying to pull myself as far away from the bar as I can get, and that includes my hand. So later when we talk about pulling slack, include your hands in that. As you're pulling away, pull and create a lot of tension in those hands, and then your grip should be stable. You shouldn't have to re-grip after that. You should be able to rotate into the bar, and you should have that grip set. The biggest issue that people have with their grip slipping is going to be when it changes. When you set it higher in your hand than you really need to it, need to, and you start to pull, and then your grip shifts, and then it's all a mess, and things really fall apart from there. So when we're talking about pulling slack later, think about pulling the slack out of your grip and pulling it into the lowest position, specifically with your first two fingers as you can manage. Now, some considerations as far as the grip width, I think are at least worth talking about here. For most people, we just want the arms to be hanging straight down. Almost always, that ends right around the knurl. Some people are just inside the knurl with maybe one finger off the knurl. Some people maybe a tad bit wider. There are some things that people can do to potentially help with whatever their specific weaknesses are. So in later sections, I'm going to elaborate on this further, but I think it's we need to at least bring it up right now and talk about how they can uh, affect each other. So. As a general rule, the closer you bring your grip together, you could bring it all the way in here. We make it a little bit more flexed from the bar, especially if it's on a deadlift bar, but we can also really help elongate our arms. Now, just from that position right there, bringing my grip, my grip closer, it forces me into a little bit of protraction with my upper back. We'll talk about how that matters later, but for some people that can be great. It can really, it can reduce range of motion. It can put them into a better position as long as I have enough of the neural to be able to actually hold on to the bar. For other people, that can be exactly the wrong move. It can, it can be horrible. They round their backs more and it really creates more issues. So the closer you go, the more protraction with your shoulders, but it can create problems. If you go wider, it's probably not gonna allow as much protraction and probably allow you to get a little bit more extension from your back. Now, these things, these changes can be literally as small as one finger wider, one finger closer, and they can make a pretty profound difference just with those little changes. So it's at least worth experimenting with. I don't think that this is an area with the grip width that people should be putting too, too much thought into. I think if currently it feels, if it feels natural, I would stick with it. Just make sure that your grip is being pulled, that slack is being pulled out as much as you can, and then it's in the lowest position of your hand that you can actually stabilize. Those other things will probably take care of themselves with the other processes that we'll go through, but I think that they're very much at least worth acknowledging. This section should be what will hopefully be the final conceptual section. After this, we'll actually be going after the deadlift, we'll actually be connected to the barbell. 
But this position, this idea, is going to be what I think is maybe the most important concept putting all of these things together. And if we can't go after what I'm about to talk about, then everything else, what was before and what's coming after, is really just not going to click. So I really want to emphasize how important it is that pretty much everybody uses a top-down setup. So what I mean by top-down, the difference would be that I'm spending as little time connected to the barbell as possible, that all my setup process, my thought process, how I'm organizing my body above the bar is happening before I'm actually connected to the bar. And for the most part, I'm staying as far away from the bar as I can. So the difference would be between a top down and what we'll call a bottom up setup is that in the bottom up setup, people spend a lot of time crouched. A lot of times they're fidgeting with their hands, trying to find a, a good grip position. And I'll come back to why that is, is not very good. And actually in, in the grip section of the video, we talked about how we're trying to set our grip against the barbell. But some of the biggest issues with the bottom up setup is that we're going to be losing so much of the length in our arms. And we're going to be almost certainly putting ourselves in a position that our hips are lower than I need than they need to be. So these are not universal rules. People can for sure deadlift well with a bottom up setup, but I might be curious to see how much better they could do by doing a top down setup. So the big things that we really want to understand what we're really trying to accomplish by doing a top down setup is going to be the combination of our arms staying as long and loose as they possibly can and not letting our knees bend more than they need to. So we'll start with the arm thing. One of the most important, maybe the most important concept in deadlifting overall is making sure that we're actually lengthening our arms. And when I say arms, I think we can include everything from my hand all the way across my back to my other hand. So we can consider that my arms are just straps. And if I didn't have arms, those straps would actually be connected across my upper, uh, my upper back. And I want that system to be as lengthened as possible. So what we need here is we have to have as much protraction of the arms, of the shoulders as we possibly can. So in this section, a lot of what we need can be trained in other places. So I'll be in the future making a video on back strength and how we can train back strength and train the position of protraction while maintaining a neutral spine. That video is coming. I think that will be a very, very big one for most people. And I think understanding those positions may help a lot with what I referenced earlier, how we can differentiate between these concepts staying on top of the bar with protraction and stabilizing the back in a neutral position versus what I already mentioned was the uh, horrible idea of leaning against the bar and pulling against a forward band. So when we're doing a top down setup, we're talking about the shoulders at this point or the arms at this point, if we do anything other than make my arms as long as possible, we are only adding range of motion to the bar or to our, to our deadlift overall. So I think a lot of times we get cues, people, coaches cue deadlifts, that people need to tighten their back or activate their lats or just in general fight what I would say is too much with their upper back. I don't think that the idea of having your lats contracted, absolutely engaging your upper back and using your upper back musculature is very important with the deadlifts. But when these become our primary cues, they end up putting us in a position that only becomes harder to maintain off the floor and makes our deadlift worse. So the difference between having my arms being protracted or creating cues using a bottom up setup to where I'm really emphasizing feeling tight against the bar and potentially shrugging my arms back, making my back feel more rigid and tighter can be dramatic in the range of motion and the position that you get in. And the main thing, I've talked about this throughout the entire video, the combination of being as upright as you can and your hips being as close to the bar, your upper back is almost always where you're going to create that space. 
So if your arms are being pulled closer, if you're retracting your shoulder blades or just being very overactive in your setup with how tight your upper back feels, you'll not only kick your hips back more, but you'll create a position to where your back is more horizontal. Assuming that you feel tight, feel good in this position, when we get to maximal loads, almost always, I can't think of an instance in my head where it doesn't change. Pretty much everyone who tries to keep their arms close and contract their upper back and cues tight back loses it off the floor. So that is one of the biggest concepts here is that if the position is going to change under maximal load, we should just be stabilizing that position in the first place. I know the counter argument here is that, well, you should just get stronger. You should get your upper back stronger, but why? Why would I put myself in a position that is mechanically less efficient? That I'm putting myself in a position that I've created extra range of motion. I've created more work on my back where I can create more efficiency by letting my arms hang looser. I can create more space to be able to rotate closer into the bar and actually have a more efficient position. This argument is absolutely horrible to me. So if you are doing something that is actively trying to retract your shoulders and really engage your upper back, and you're not putting yourself in a position to where your arms are long and loose during your setup, you are actively sabotaging your deadlift. And that's all there is to it. In the next section, when we're talking about pulling slack, we're gonna elaborate on how to create tension in this position. But conceptually, we have to understand that the longer and the looser that you can make your arms will only allow you to get into a better position overall. And that will create more efficiency. And that will reduce the work that your back actually has to do. The legs follow a very similar pattern to the upper body in this. If I spend too much time trying to feel very, very rigid, if I'm crouching down to the bar, even with my arms long and loose, if I'm sitting down in that bottom position and really trying to feel that my legs are very open, almost always people are starting too low. One of the concepts that I have when I'm deadlifting is what I would call the tipping point. So in the, the combination of adding the long, loose arms, but trying to make sure that I feel like my legs are loose enough that they allow rotation, I have what I call a tipping point in my setup. So when I'm approaching the bar, when I'm trying to feel out my position before I'm actually connected to the bar, I crouch down only enough to feel like I'm in a position to where I can comfortably reach the bar and maintain some degree of hinge. So what this means is I'm trying to bend my knees and stay in a relaxed position. As soon as I get to a point to where I really feel like my quads have very much turned on, that's the tipping point, that's too low. The reason being, if I put myself in a position to where I am being very, very active with my legs or trying very hard to hold a certain position, sometimes the position is not necessarily their quads pressing really hard, but they're having to drive really hard with their knees to stay open. This is going to start creating too much rigidity, too much tension around our trunk area to where we're actually now going to limit our rotation. The way that we are going to be able to rotate as much as we can is being able to utilize the space that we're creating from the long loose arms. So when I'm getting into my position, it's important that I don't go lower than that tipping point. If I start really trying to, to feel like I'm driving my knees out during my setup and finding the perfect position, I am absolutely going to limit the space, the distance away from the bar that I can really create. We're gonna come up with a lot of strategies in the next section on how to pull slack to where we actually do create that appropriate tension in our legs and create tension in our upper backs. But if I cross the tipping point to where I now have to actively try to fight for that position, I'm going to slow down that whole movement and make it way more rigid and most likely put myself in a position that's much more forced rather than a comfortable position that I can aggressively rot rotate into and create a lot of tension. I think as a final thought on this topic, we can look at beltless deadlifts and that many, many lifters, especially sumo deadlifters, but conventional deadlifter deadlifters as well, tend to be able to pull very close to their same numbers without a belt as they do with a belt. 
I think this is an interesting way to, to talk about the two concepts that I, that I just laid out here. And going back to the beginning where I talked about we don't want as much pressure against the belt with our air because it can make it too restrictive. So when we're trying to set up, when we're trying to stay above the tipping point with our legs and trying to make our arms long and loose, those two things together, and including the not too much pressure with the air, so three things together, all of those things added together are the objective is trying to allow us to be able to get into the best position that we possibly can. Too much rigidity ahead of time is going to limit that position. If I'm very tense with my upper back, I'm not going to be able to rotate as far. It's going to make me go lower. If I'm too tense with my legs, it's gonna block me off from rotating in. If I've created too much pressure in my abdomen, it may limit those other things on either side of it. If I'm very, very tense, I may not be able to change that position with my upper body, or it may limit how close that my hips can rotate. So many deadlifters, especially sumo, they can pull very, very close to their belted numbers without a belt because the position that they're able to get into is probably every bit as good and potentially better. So this may be something to try for a lot of people. Take your belt off. Try to, to create that brace without the belt. Try to see if your rotation, if your position changes. If you actually feel better without a belt, my argument would not be that the belt is in your way, but that you're doing all of these other things incorrectly, that you're trying to get too tight, that you're expanding too hard against the air, uh, against the belt with your air, that you're just generally limiting your best position. And the trade-off, while you feel more tight, is a significantly, or at least in this case, noticeably worse position that is limiting your ability to produce force and limiting your efficiency overall. So that's an interesting experiment I think for most people is to play around with some beltless training. Do it in warmups, do it, do it for some rep work. But I think with practice, people find that they're able to replicate that position very well. So when you put your belt back on, if you're, if you're now feeling like your position is worse, it potentially is. So that's what I would challenge people to do is to try to replicate being as loose as you can in order to create a better position. So now we should have a pretty good understanding of all the concepts that make up for a pretty good deadlift. So now we need to start pulling. In this section, we're gonna be talking about pulling slack. This was the most common question when I asked on Instagram what people really struggled with. Pulling slack was one of the biggest ones. And what I will say here is that pulling slack is the deadlift. There's really not much after it. If you have accomplished everything else before this, we're building it from the top down that once we get to the position that now I'm trying to pull slack and create leverage against the bar, we are deadlifting. And I think that statement is what people sort of miss, is they think, oh, I need to pull slack so that I can deadlift well. Pulling slack is the deadlift. Pulling slack is what gets the bar off the floor. Pulling slack does put you into the position that you need to be in. Any issues that happen after that Almost always we can look at how you're leaving the floor, what position you're getting into, just the general process overall. So if you're struggling with pulling slack, you may be thinking about it backwards. You may be thinking that, oh, if I could just get tighter, which I think goes back to some of those other things that I said. You may be thinking about creating tension against the barbell and putting yourself in some of those worst positions. When I'm talking about pulling slack, I don't like thinking about pulling slack out of the bar. That does happen. There's a little bit of slack in the bar. The bar can bend a little bit. There's sometimes some space just in the, the bar and the collar and the plates and all of that. Sure, there's a little bit of slack. There's a lot more slack in your body. We intentionally tried to create slack in that last section. I tried to make you be loose in your arms. You were even loose in your legs. We also didn't even brace in your trunk as much as we can. Now we have to stabilize those things. So if you are thinking about pulling slack out of the bar and not thinking about pulling slack out of your body, thinking pulling, about, pulling slack out of the entire system, you've got it all backwards. Pulling slack is the deadlift and that's what it should feel like. It should be a whole lot of effort. You should be pulling the bar very, very hard. You should be well, pulling the bar hard. You should be using the weight of the bar to pull your arms as long as they can. So what we need to think about when we're pulling slack 
is that we are trying to create leverage in those positions that we've already talked about, where my shoulder blades are on top of the bar, where my arms are long and loose, where my, my upper body is as upright as I can without getting my hips too low. But we're gonna be using everything else to get there. So the most important thing here is that when I'm creating this tension, that I don't change anything else. A lot of times people will do these things and then all of a sudden they say, okay, I've created my long arms, my loose arms, but now I need to grip really hard and I need to feel that slack out of the bar. We're doing that wrong. The objective is to create tension in that high loose position that we've created. That's why we have to think about pulling the slack out of our body. So now that I'm going for my top down setup and we have the understanding of what kind of grip we need to use and, and we have our loose legs and everything, now we need to actually start deadlifting. Generally speaking, there's two different styles of doing this. One I think is a little bit looser that we're going to use a little bit more aggressive of a slack pull, but we're still doing all of the same things as the second option. The second option is that we maintain a little bit more tension through the entire process. Neither one of these is bad overall, but I do think that a little bit more of an aggressive kind of looser setup is going to be something that benefits higher skill lifters, people who can rotate a little bit closer to the bar, people who are a little bit more consistent with the position that they get into. The second option where we're gonna be able to maintain our attention a little bit longer through the slack pull is going to be hopefully in a way that we're going to generate a little bit more consistency. And we're not quite as interested in getting as close. Maybe you're a closer stance deadlifter and you're just not, you don't need to open up quite as far. So we're gonna talk about both of these options, but they're built on the same fundamentals. I think the best place to start is actually option number two. So we're, with this option, we are going to stay a little bit more rigid through the entire setup. We're gonna maintain a little bit more tension through our backs, through our legs, but all of the processes that happen before it, still the same cues about being long and loose, are still gonna be in place. So to get started with this, when I'm doing my top down setup and I'm reaching for the bar, once I get my tension, I'm just not really gonna let it go. I think this option is probably going to be the best for people who do lack some consistency. Either way, what we really want to see is that there's just not very much movement, that I'm not trying to fidget around, that I'm not trying to have a whole lot of rotation happen, that once I create that tension against the bar, I rotate relatively quickly in a short amount of time, not necessarily super aggressively, and I find my position and I start generating pressure. So what we need to look at in the concept of slack pulling and again, it's absolutely critical that my arms are long and loose. Once I'm connected to the barbell, we'll say that I, I reach down to the barbell, I get it with my fingertips, I get the bar fully as we talked about in the grip section that it's low in my hands. Now, I need to press away from the bar. We're not thinking about the bar. We're not thinking about pulling tension out of the bar. Well, we're pulling tension out of our body and out of the system overall. So with my arms being long and loose, I'm pushing into the floor while actively pressing my upper back and my hips away from the bar. So we should feel like we're expanding, like we're trying to push against walls that are closing in on us. The floor and the ceiling is pressing down and we're needing to expand against both of those. That's how we create tension with my arms being long and loose, now I'm resisting that. So I'm not saying my upper back does nothing. I think it would be a very, very big mistake for you to when you're in this position and you pull long and loose to make your upper back stretch more. That would be bad. We're creating tension by putting our arms in the longest position with our arms as protracted as we can that we can stabilize. So we're creating tension, pushing our shoulders up as high as we can, our hips as high as we can. So now we have pressure into the floor, pressure with our upper backs. And from there, it should be a relatively small rotation to be able to find the position that I need to be in. Going back to my how to hinge video, we should be in a position to where we're on top of the bar the whole time. We've talked about this innumerable times throughout the video. None of that changes. During my setup, my shoulders are on top of the bar. I create space by hinging just a little bit to allow myself this room to rotate. Now that I've created tension, 
the cues should be chest through, head up. We're gonna cover the head up, the upper back stuff in a later section, in the last section of this video. But either way, the process now is that I do need to try to get to the position to where my upper back is as upright as I can get and my hips are as close to the bar as they can get without changing anything else. This has to be done fairly aggressively. I have an old video talking about how when I pull slack out of the bar, how much tension is needed to actually see the bar bend. Just from me experimenting with it, it's about 500 pounds. If you're working with a regular power bar to see any noticeable flex in the bar, it's about 500 pounds. Now, when I'm pulling 700, 800 pounds, we see that bar flexing significantly before I actually leave the floor. I'm pulling about 500 pounds and potentially more to get into my position. This is not slack out of the bar. This is slack out of my body. I'm creating at least, if not more, 500 plus pounds of tension. Now, for somebody else, you don't have that total strength, right? But we're still creating a very high percentage of tension to resist extra flexion. We've already got as lengthened as we need to. We don't wanna be more lengthened but we're using that length to create a good position to be into. Now we have to rotate into a position to where I'm on top of the barbell. My hips are relatively close. Again, what fits your anatomy, what fits your stance. If you have a closer stance, they may end up going slightly, the knees may go a little bit forward, but all of those things match the processes that we've already created. But we're just maintaining that tension and the rotation is going to be fairly small. I think that's a big point is that if we've set up all of these other things well, at this point, the rotation should be simple. It shouldn't feel like a lot. I should go from the position to where I do have my slack to be able to rotate to where I'm actually pulling in not much time at all. It shouldn't feel like a lot of movement. And I think that's a lot of times where people mess up. They think that there's more to it than there really is. So once you have that tension and you rotate, you're deadlifting. That's it. There's gonna be a little minutia that we can talk about with you know, what you can do to maintain a little bit better position off the floor, how you can improve your lockout, the timing. But if you're thinking that there's a next step that after you rotate, after, well, after you pull slack and after you rotate, that now you need to do something different in order to, to actually have the deadlift go better, you're wrong. This is where it happens. So we have to be able to have a good understanding of everything that happens before it and then pulling slack is deadlifting. Now the other option is going to be very, very similar. The only difference is that I would say this one is maybe a little bit more advanced. It has a little bit more room for error, but it has some potential very good rewards. So the difference between, I guess I called the first one style two, but anyway, the difference between these two styles is that we're going to be releasing a little bit of that tension in our body, some of the slack that we pulled in order to be able to rotate a little bit further. We may also get a little bit extra protraction or a little bit extra thoracic rounding to be able to create a little bit more efficient of a position. So this is the style that I use. I'm not saying that to say that this is the one that certainly you should use. I think this is something that over time people can become a lot more comfortable with. But if you start with the previous style to where there's just not a lot of change happening, you're going to limit so many variables and you can recreate your process a whole lot better. I actually use this process with a little bit more of a, a consistent slack pull. If I'm feeling kind of awkward, if I'm feeling like my deadlifts aren't all that fluid, I'll actually start with the previous style to just get a, a good feeling of where I want my body to be and kind of how I want my leverages to be. And then as I start feeling more fluid, I become a lot more aggressive and I may not maintain that slack pull with as much pressure, with as much rigidity as I can. The point being that while I can relax my arms a little bit more and keep a little bit extra tension out of my legs, I'm going to be able to rotate a little bit closer to the bar a little bit more comfortably. The big thing here is that I still have to be able to stay as far away from the bar as I can. So there's some degree of pressure. There's some degree of tension. I have enough tension in my body to create as much space as I can away from the barbell and still maintain those positions without getting too low, without opening more than I need to because if I don't maintain that degree of pressure, I may have other errors. I may rotate too far. So I think that's what we need to look at here, is that if you get too loose during your setup, if you're not pulling slack effectively, 
many of these errors come in. People rotate too far behind the bar. People sit down too far. People's knees go too far forward. If you're having these issues, please go back to the first option and just keep tension and rotate and find the position to where you really have leverage on top of the bar and you're able to push into the ground and feel like you can generate some pressure from there. If you're having these errors to where you really feel like you're getting jostled out of position, you need to have more consistent tension overall. But if you're doing a good job with that, this option may allow you to rotate a little bit closer and to stay further away from the bar and limit how much range of motion that you have and make your deadlift a little bit more efficient overall. It also can do a good job of adding aggression, which is a, a big deal with deadlifts anyway, actually being able to attack the weight. So I think this option can be very, very good for maximizing the most that you can absolutely get out of your deadlift, but it does have risks. And I think many of the errors that people have with their deadlifts come from trying to do this style. They see people being loose and aggressive and rotating aggressively and quickly, and they wanna to try to replicate that. But without an understanding of everything that happens before it, you end up putting yourself in a worse position and really just finding yourself landing in one of those other big mechanical efficiencies that we've already talked about. So at this point, we should have a pretty good conceptual understanding of what makes a sumo deadlift effective. But I think that we can dive in a little bit to some of the minutia from person to person that may make some people successful by adapting with some different styles. I think one of the biggest things that we can look at here is the head position and how that really affects the upper back. So I'm actually gonna use those two terms kind of interchangeably. I think they go together, and again, going back to a lot of my hinge videos, the things that I mentioned there are that the head and the upper back really should be in unison. If your head comes up, the objective there is to create more extension. If your head comes down, it's probably because we're extending too much and we're trying to get a little bit more rounded, flexed, but really it's, it's all about creating an effort of neutrality. So if I talk about the head coming up, we can really just say, that that's creating more extension in the upper back and vice versa. If I say head down a little bit, we can say that that's creating a little bit more flexion, but most of the time it's really with the objective of lengthening the arms more. So that is going to be a big difference from person to person and potentially affect speed off the floor, kind of have some unique differences from person to person that fits their body types. So when we're looking at this, it's going to be important to know that there's not a good or bad. Again, with all of the lifters that we've outlined here, we can see a pretty dramatic difference between what the upper back position is. Jamal is a very, very successful deadlifter and starts with a pretty rounded back off the floor, right? I don't round quite so much, but we end up in a pretty similar position overall. So the big thing is that we just have to understand trade-offs. The more extended that you get with your upper back, generally speaking, the further back that your hips are. For some people who can get very close to the bar, this may not end up being a big trade-off at all. Other people, if they extend their back a whole lot more, it may push their hips back significantly more, and it may end up being very, very problematic for them, making it significantly harder. On the other side, if somebody's really rounding dramatically off the floor, it may be useful to use some of those things that we talked about in the grip area, where widening the grip may help create a little bit more extension, a little bit more opportunity for extension and strength in the upper back. But also, bringing the head up may allow a little bit more recruitment, maybe influence them to extend their upper back more and help with their strength off the floor. So this is a big area to where I think just trial and error is going to make a really big difference. In a lot of my previous videos, I talk about how biasing a little bit more towards the head being a little bit more down to create link with the arms probably helps the process overall. Long term though, I think pretty much everybody is going to end up bringing their head up more as they go. Now, up is relative. I don't think that the average person needs to throw their head back much to really try to exaggerate extension. So much of what I've laid out in this video is about creating length in the arms, creating space. And we don't wanna ruin that by thinking that the upper back needs to be as tight as possible and, and really going in the wrong direction there. But 
throwing the head back a little bit more, and probably not throwing it back, but bringing the head up more can create more extension and help influence all of the other processes that we've talked about. For me, I do everything that we said about, you know, the top down setup, I'm um, trying to stay loose, trying to lengthen my arms as much as possible, but my head position absolutely rotates aggressively up as I'm leaving the floor. This process really helps influence my position to be able to create extension, to fight against the weight on the bar, to set myself against the bar and to pull slack more effectively. All of that to me is just head position. I'm just cueing head through, but all those other things that we've already talked about are happening. I'm rotating forward, I'm rotating through, I'm creating leverage, but it's all about creating that same, same length, that same leverage, pulling slack effectively. So we can look at these, this position, the options in this position, and fit it to the lifter. If you're doing a good job in the position that you're in, if you're leveraging appropriately, your back is rounded a little bit, and your head is fairly down, you may not need to change that. But if you're really, really struggling to lock it out and your back is rounding off the floor, it may be a good option to go for a little bit more extension and bring your head up some. On the other side of it, if you're really struggling off the floor, if you feel like you're um, trying too hard to get extended, maybe biasing a little bit more, at least for the time being, bringing your head down more can help lengthen those arms and give you a little bit more opportunity to leave the floor a little bit more fluidly. So finally, I wanted to talk about lockouts. Now, this is the last one in the video, and it probably is gonna be one of the smaller sections. As I've said in every other section, they all kind of build on top of each other. And once we've gotten here, I don't know that we're gonna have that many issues anymore. Most of these issues are going to be solved somewhere along the way previously. Now, we can still look at some of the, the issues that show up for people and identify what may be going on, but I think the most common issue with lockouts is that people try to lean back too early. So that's gonna be the main one that we talk about here. Many of the other issues that people have with their lockout strength is just related to position off the floor. If they're back, if your back rounds a lot off the floor, if you're giving a lot, if you're really lengthening those arms, the trade-off is going to be lockout strength. So we'll talk about how to potentially solve those issues. And a lot of it comes down to increasing your back strength overall, maybe changing your head position to get a little bit more extension. But one of the biggest issues is just poor timing. So one of the main problems that people have is they get to the lockout. Let's say, we'll say the lockout is anything that's past the knees. So once we've moved past the knees in the sumo deadlift, we're going to consider that process the lockout. Where people usually make the mistake is if they feel like their back is rounding and they're kind of starting to struggle, they really lean back too early. The problem is we lose leverage over the bar. At the very beginning, we talked about how staying on top of the bar to be able to have that leverage on top of your center of mass was absolutely critical. That's still the case here. So commonly the cue is that we need to lock out our knees before our hips, and that's what's going on. So if I get to my knees and I feel like my back is rounding and I'm, I'm not gonna be able to finish it, so I need to lean against it, we're gonna put ourselves in this position to where I no longer have the ability to press with my legs anymore because my center of mass is off. But I also don't really have the ability to extend and you know, extend with my back, press with my hips forward, any of those kind of things at all because my, just, my balance, my leverages aren't in a position to be able to produce force. So. As difficult as it is, if you are having that issue, if you feel like you're getting to the top and your back strength is a problem, your back is rounding, you have to stay on top of the bar. You have to clear your knees first. As the bar is traveling past your knees, continue to pull up. My cue is up before back, right? Knees before hips works really well, but I want to pull as far up as I possibly can and have my knees lock out before I really think about pulling back. Now, that doesn't mean that I should keep my trunk angle horizontal or that it shouldn't change at all through the entire lift. That'll be happening naturally. Just in an effort of me trying to pull as much as I can, my trunk angle will be changing some. I'm just not trying to lean back until I have no more upward movement. So even if your back is rounding, people think that they need to try to pull against that earlier. 
your lockout is just going to be the hard part. And that's all there is to it. We can do things like getting your back stronger. You may experiment with getting a little bit more extension in your back and having that trade off of potentially slightly harder off the floor. But if you make the mistake of pulling backwards and leaning behind the bar, you're only gonna put yourself in this position to where you don't have any leverage and your lockout becomes even harder. So we have to practice timing. One of the ways that we can do this is in lighter sets, in warmups, trying to make the lockout feel as short as possible. That you do pull up as, as far as you can before leaning back, but that your lockout is relatively short. You shouldn't feel like you really have to have your arms pulling a really long way. When you're locking out, try to feel that your arms hang low. This is an important topic because I think a lot of times this can lead to soft shoulders, people not really pulling back. So we do have to actively continue to try to extend, to pull our chest through, to fight for those positions. But if we give ourselves a good opportunity to have our, near, our knees actually clear and finish all the way up, our leverages will work significantly better to be able to finish this. So we're gonna have to work on back strength all along. That'll probably be the issue for most people. Some other issues, kicking the bar forward, <laughs> all of those other issues are really just related to other positions previously. So I don't think that we need to diagnose them here. So again, as long as we have the setup taken care of, as long as the process is in order, by the time we get to the lockout, we should just be done. If I've set up my slack pull, if I've put myself in a position to where my leverage is appropriate, at this point, the lockout should just flow pretty naturally. So that is your how to sumo deadlift encyclopedia. If you like this video, please share it, give it a thumbs up. Obviously that gives me a lot of encouragement. I do like making these videos, but they're extremely time consuming to put together things like this. I have a lot more videos coming and your enthusiasm about this definitely encourages me to do more of those things. Ask me questions. Like I said, I don't always know exactly what people are missing. So put some comments in there, watch for those future videos. If you did like this video and you want to support the channel, the best way to do it is to buy a t-shirt, um, purchase from anything in the, in the links below. All of those do have some sort of financial impact for me. So those things do support me, but anyway, watch these videos, share them with your friends. I like just having all the engagement and I do like making the videos. So anyway, I appreciate all of the support. Thanks a lot for everybody being involved with this. Hopefully it helps and we'll see you next time.